Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news with your hosts, Greg Prescott and Kendra Gilbert. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, 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 one. Namaste and welcome to N5D Radio coming to you from the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Sarasota, Florida every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. midnight in the UK, and 9 a.m. Tuesday morning in Australia. I'm your host, Greg Prescott from N5D.com, and for the next two hours we're going to be raising the vibration of the planet, galaxy, and universe. Tonight is our paranormal extravaganza where we're going to be talking about Bigfoot, UFOs, fairies, shadow people, orbs, ghosts, and anything that goes bump in the night. So if you have any paranormal experiences that you would like to share with us, then give us a call at 646-716-8890. But first, I'd like to introduce my co-host coming to you from the rainlands of Ocala, Florida, (laughs) Kendra Kilford. Hi, Kendra. Hey, Greg. How are you? Outstanding. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, it hasn't been so bad over here. It's actually been really, really nice, and I think I can even detect a hint of fall coming. The winds blowing through are nice and cool, and I can feel the the, the turn of the season is starting to take place. So, no. yay! No. <laughs> Summer 24/7, 365. <laughs> Well, it's been a little bit hot, a little bit too hot for my liking uh, the last few uh, weeks, but, um, yeah, it's been nice. All right. <laughs> well, uh, tonight's news is more of a pep talk, really, um, as the world is bracing for either the beginning of World War III or a false flag prelude event to take place. One can always find peace, hope, and strength within the massive awakening taking place right now, guys spreading like an unstoppable virus across the entire planet, infecting the hearts and the minds of people from all walks of life, despite previous religious and cultural divisions, and despite thousands of years of programming. Humanity is finally rising from its sleep and preparing to take back its rightful place as the free, loving, unified, sovereign beings were meant to be. And now is not the time to be afraid or to allow the fear-mongering propaganda gain ownership of our minds. We are living in the end days of an age gone mad. And we're at the very threshold to the beginning of a very new era of peace, love, and unity. And we're all looking forward to this. So using extreme discernment is so vital to everybody right now. If something encourages or triggers fear, hate, or negative emotional response, learn to look deeper into its purpose, its source, its roots, its potential agenda. If something appears to be gaining a lot of attention, look at the smaller headlines. Connect the dots to the bigger picture that might be hidden in plain sight. We have to remember that we've been living in a world of illusion and deceit for many long, long years, uh, a literal Truman Show. And the only way we can break this spell and expose the great Oz who's been hiding behind the curtains is to just rip them down. So for more information and uh, today's most informative alternative news and headlines, visit the N5D website. Thank you so much, and back to you, Greg. You know, we were just talking about this before we went on air, how all of these uh, alternative news websites are really making a huge difference on this, what's, what, what's going on in Syria right now. And it's really ultimately um, exposing all of those that are in power who are trying to push for this World War III scenario and uh, it's really exciting to see all these people coming together and exposing those who are really not working in the best interests of humanity. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. It's, it, we're definitely putting a dent in their plan. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I love it. Yeah, me too. I love it. <laughs> so, uh, Kendra, how would you like to kick this off? Well, tonight is our paranormal extravaganza, like you said a moment ago. So, uh I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, for me, I've always placed, you know, paranormal experiences into, the, you know, like three different categories. Um, for me, anything that uh, is unexplainable and very creepy or somewhat malevolent in nature to 
Um, you know, the second category, which is more or less like things that are happening that are unexplainable but are helpful, beautiful, or even welcoming. And then a third category, which are things that are unexplainable but seem to really do nothing other than make you scratch your head <laughs> and are either, you know, validated later as just, you know, something uh, that didn't make sense at the time but made sense later or just stays with you, like a, a, just a vivid memory, and you never can quite figure it out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Greg, what, what's one of your most memorable uh, paranormal, paranormal experiences? Wow. Um, and that's, that's such a loaded question, because after I watched The Secret, I asked the universe to show me as many amazing things as possible in this world, and it has. Now, from what I understand, the definition of paranormal includes events that are beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding. So, for me, it has to do with these metaphysical animals that are, have been coming into my life. Now, here's a great example. And I've mentioned this, I think, once before on uh, Inside D Radio. I, I was uh, up in upstate New York about three years ago, and my bedroom was on the second floor of this house, and I took a nap. I was supposed to pick up my daughter um, later on, mid-afternoon or so. So I took a nap beforehand, and I woke up to this rustling sound, and I couldn't figure out what it was. So eventually I found out that there was an animal in my room, and I couldn't tell whether it was, <laughs> couldn't tell whether it was a porcupine <laughs> or a woodchuck or, or whatever. So I ended up uh, shutting the door and telling my daughter, okay, I got something in my bedroom here. <laughs> we got, I'll be there in a shortly to pick you up, and I'll be right back, and we'll go back and figure out what it is. So we get back, and I, I got a better view of it and, and found out that it was a woodchuck. And uh, actually, if you go to the um, N5D, you can see the video. It's called WTF. There's a woodchuck in my bedroom. And I'm going to post the link here in the chat room. So if you guys want to check it out, you can. But uh, I thought that was a really cool thing because the woodchuck normally hibernates. It goes into the ground. But yet this woodchuck entered through the basement, crawled up the basement steps, up the stairs to the second floor where my bedroom was, and came into my bedroom. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I actually seen that video. It was quite hilarious. <laughs> oh, well, don't don't say the ending because the ending is oh, no. really <laughs> the, the ending is worth the whole video. But uh, <laughs> it, it was great. So you know, and that's that's just one of the uh, situations where I had this uh, animal come into my life. Now the other day I had a dream of a bear, and I was at my house, and uh, and once again I had a lot of dreams where I was born and raised in upstate New York, and a lot of my dreams are up there. So what it's telling me is home, not necessarily my physical home here on earth, but home as in maybe in the uh, ethereal realms. So anyway, I have this uh, dream of a bear and I'm walking around my house in upstate New York and I see this bear and he's standing up on his back leg. So I run back to the porch and there's this um, Alaskan woman and a child on my porch. And there's the bottom drawer that came out of a refrigerator that's out there and a bunch of food that was in it. I'm like, screw the food. Come on in. Follow me. And I run in the house, and I'm starting to shut the windows and all and to make sure that the bear wasn't uh, going to come in through there. And I assume that they followed me through. Uh, but anyway, I, I cracked the door open to see if the bear's on the back porch, and he's standing up there <laughs> oh, geez, staring me in the face, and I shut the door. And, but it, it, what's weird is I wasn't scared. You know, it, it was like, I'm not going to let him in, but nah, yeah, <laughs> you're okay right there, and I'm okay in here. But the, yeah, that was my dream of that. Now, the other day, I was, uh, I was on the phone, and I was on my back porch, and while I was talking on the phone, I have my surfboard back there, and it kind of fell over, so I lifted it up, and there was a baby frog under there, and so I caught the frog, and, and my, my porch is enclosed, so I took him outside and let him go, and... Uh, so, I mean, once again, so we've had the woodchuck, the bear, the frog. And then I was at my sister's house stargazing one night. I'm laying on the back of my, my convertible and just looking up at the stars, and I heard these pitter-patters of, of paws walking on the, on the street. So I sit up, and there's a coyote there, a full-grown coyote just walking by. And he looks at me, and I look at him, and he looks, looks away again and keeps walking. And you would think that he would be freaked out and run away or whatever, but it was really cool. About a half hour, 45 minutes later, I hear, once again, I hear the pitter-patter of feet on the, on, the, on the pavement, and I look up, and there's a baby coyote, and he's walking in a, in a different direction, and we do the same thing. I sit up, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and 
he didn't run away either. So all these animals are coming into my life, and there seems to be a clear message that I'm getting. Now, the woodchuck and the bear, they both hibernate and then come out in the springtime. The frog starts out as a tadpole and be, turns, into a, uh, turns into a frog as it matures. Uh, so what I'm getting is this message that we're all in for this uh, rebirth that's coming up. And it's not, my message isn't just for me, it's for everyone, um, that there's a rebirth coming on and that something huge, we're on the verge of something huge happening. Now, the coyote, that teaches resourcefulness and adapting to new situations. And they're also great teachers which is what I do with in 5D. So the common theme of, with animals and symbolism tends to revolve around rebirth. One of my psychology classes in college was the psychology of sleep and dreams. And I remember having this dream where I was straddling the top of three ladders in the foundation of a house that was being built. Now, in your dreams, any type of transportation or housing is actually you. So I saw this dream as another dream involving rebirth but what I found especially interesting was the three ladders in my dream. Now, what do you think a ladder symbolizes in dream analogy? Raising your awareness, uh, the ascension of the mind. I know that, you know, that word's kind of taboo for some people, but maybe like a, just an ascension of awareness. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. What, what, what? That's good. The, the, oh. <laughs> those, those, those are good guesses. Now, most of the time, a ladder symbolizes success if you're going up the ladder, or failure if you're going down, or the ladder, you fall off the ladder, or the ladder hits you in the head or something. <laughs> oh, geez. But, but there isn't, really isn't any metaphysical dream analysis dictionaries out there. So if you look at the ladder from a metaphysical standpoint, mm -hmm. what do you think it represents? What does a ladder represent metaphysically? Well, uh, I, would, I would, again, I had to have to say, once again, just the, you know, a higher state of awareness, um, the ascension, opening of the crown chakra, you know, going um, upward toward, uh, to, to source. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, that's what it would be. Okay, and that, that's good, but it also, from a metaphysical sense, sense, represents the strands of DNA. Oh, okay, well, yeah, of course, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this dream told me, because I was, I was standing on two ladders and straddling a third. So this dream told me that the house, which isn't only me but everyone, is being built and that we are in the process of having a DNA upgrade. And these, uh. ran, and these random animals that are coming into my, my life are confirming this. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my kind of a metaphysical thing. It's all wrapped up into a bunch of symbols and symbolisms and stuff like that, but it's all giving me a message, and it, it is from beyond. So I'm curious, what paranormal experiences are you most memorable, are most memorable, memorable in your life? You know, it, it's kind of hard for me to pick out a most memorable paranormal event, but, uh, you know, I have I have one that's my most favorite, and it's probably because out of all the paranormal experiences that I've had, it showed me that I'm being watched over and protected, and I've always felt protected by a very powerful and loving source. Um, but I was pretty young. Um, it was, you know, I was in my mid-teens, and uh, my lifelong best friend at the time um, and I decided to go to uh, Orlando, Church Street Station, which is kind of a, a rowdy place, and we had really no business being there. <laughs> but, um, you know, we were a little on the wild side back in the day. And um, anyway, to make a somewhat longer, you know, story shorter, um, and, and I do have this experience written out in detail on my Lightworker Ads blog, but we we arrived um, at this at the you know at the Church Street Station location. It's basically just a, a street, and then there's these nightclubs that line up along the, the side of the strip. And um, anyway, we we park our car kind of in a secluded area because there wasn't a lot of parking and we didn't want to, you know, have to go fighting for space. So we park our car and we get out and we start walking toward, you know, um, the, the, the uh, strip. And, you know, I mean, we, we were young and, you know, trying to look cool and be cool and, you know, be all hot and everything, you know, two young girls out. We were wanting to have a good time. And, you know, we're laughing and having, a, and having our fun. And I heard um, a car coming toward us. And um, I actually, you know, got kind of a 
an instant feeling like, oh, geez, you know, this isn't good. But as the car started coming closer to us, I heard these girls in the car, and they were yelling and hollering and making noise and, um, you know, blurting out insults out of the window at us and just kind of trying to provoke some type of response. And obviously I, you know, obliged them by, you know, giving them a one-finger salute. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that didn't help. So anyway, I thought that was going to be the end of it, and, um, you know, I, we kept on walking. Well, anyway, this car spins around and decides to come back and um, greet us on the way um, back on, uh, you know, because we were getting closer and closer to where we were trying to get, but we didn't quite make it there all the way. They they kind of inter intercepted us. But uh, anyway, this girl just jumps out of her car, and she runs up to me, and she's screaming in my face, and her spit's flying in my face, and she kept saying, I'm going to slice your face, I'm going to slice your face, I'm going to, you know, this, and I'm going to kill you, and who do you think you are? And at first, I was just kind of shocked, because I've never been confronted like that before, ever in my life, ever. Um, I looked to my side to see, with my, my friend, because I was with my girlfriend, and I looked to see where she was at, and she had already taken off, and she was kind of hiding behind me, behind a trash can. Um, and I was just standing there um, completely in shock. And I noticed when I looked at this girl that she had um, an object in her hand. And I looked even closer and realized that she had a knife. And she was getting ready to use it. <laughs> um, I felt panicked, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, this is it. You know, um, I don't really have any way out of this. I'm either going to have to be able to fight this person off or I'm going to end up stabbed and lying here bleeding to death in the, in the street tonight. You know, this really is putting a damper on my plans. So <laughs> anyway, um, out of nowhere, uh, this, this person comes out from behind, just out of nowhere really, and he's standing there next to, to me all of a sudden. Um, he had uh, blonde hair, just beautiful blonde straight, you know, hair these blue eyes that you could just dive into. It was like looking into the ocean. They were just beautiful. And he wasn't really dressed like normal people would dress on a hot night out in Florida. He had long pants on and a long sleeve shirt that was rolled up. It was just different, different style of clothes altogether. And he put his hand between me and this girl. And when he did this, I felt this instant I don't know how to explain it. It was almost like a sedation, and, 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 I, and I just was like, oh, my gosh, this feels so awesome because it was just instant relief, instant calmness, peace, and all he said was, he goes, that's enough, and he put his hand between us. Well, the girl that was confronting me, she got this look of, on her face like, what in the heck is going on? Because she lost all control of her arms. They fell to her sides. I mean, she was just literally knocked completely she just rendered useless. Her arms just dropped to her side, um, and he just took me around the shoulders and walked me, started walking me toward our, our vehicle. And at this whole time that this is happening, I'm like, this, this is insane. I, I can't believe that he was able to just do that, and it's over, you know. And I felt completely safe and protected, and I looked over, and I see my girlfriend also had someone helping her. It was a, a gentleman in a black trench coat. And these guys just came out of nowhere. I'm like, wow, this is really nice, you know, cool. Well, they didn't have any clue to where our car was parked, but somehow walked us straight directly to our vehicle, got us in the car. He looks in, my, in the window, in the passenger side window where I was sitting. He stuck his head in, and he said, are you going to be all right? And I looked over at him, and I was like, yes, I think we're going to be fine. I looked over to my left to, to look at my friend who was in the driver's seat, and I don't know. It was weird. I was like, wow, this guy's kind of cute. You know, I think I'm, you know, let's get his phone number. I turned around, and this all happened in a split second. I turned around to face the window again just to talk to him, and he was gone. He completely and totally disappeared off the face of the planet. I, we looked for him. We, we looked down the roads, and there was nowhere for them to go. There was just nowhere. They would have had to have walked, because it was a building with a sidewalk, and no doors for them to go in, nowhere to, for them to hide or, or nothing. They just instantly disappeared as quickly as they appeared. So I know that, um, you know, there's got to be something there. I, it's, a, it's a memory that has always been with me, always will stay with me. And I've tried to make sense of it, but, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things that I hold in my heart, and I know for a fact that they, 
that was that was for me. You know, that was my gift, mm -hmm. and um, it was just a beautiful experience, and and I'm very thankful for it. And that's one of the more positive paranormal experiences that I like to talk about. You know, because a lot of people, I think, they just instantly associate paranormal activity with something that's dark, or something that's scary. But really, paranormal events can be very, very positive and amazingly beautiful and uh, gifts, you know. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. <laughs> That's a, what a great story that is. You know, and I have a feeling that you have several earth angels looking out for you. I think so, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was talking earlier about animals and symbolism. Are there any animals that have come into your life that have had any kind of metaphysical meaning to you? Well, the turkey vulture for sure has been staking its claim <laughs> really? over here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, every day, um, it's great. You know, I'll go outside and and I see turkey vultures swarming above my head and coming really, really close. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's also the area that we're living in. I mean, we've got raccoons that are looking in the back window. We've got falcons, you know, hawk, all kinds of beautiful things. But I tell you one thing that I thought was really interesting. Um, lately, I've been doing uh, the uh, sunbathing, the 15-minute interval sunbathing, to get my, you know, vitamin D dosage <laughs> um, up a, up a little. But I'm I'm laying down out, outside on my yoga mat, getting some sun, and I'm so peaceful and I and I'm like oh gosh this feels so good I'm feeling all this energy come into my body and I'm relaxing and then all of a sudden I feel something that squiggled it like squiggled between my arm and my side all the way from my hip all the way up to my armpit it freaked me out so bad and I'm going oh my god and you know when you're in sunbathing you you can't just I don't know, because your eyes are kind of messed up for a minute, you know, because when you try to open your eyes and see, you're kind of blinded for a second. At least I get that way. Mm -hmm. And I jump up, and I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I know what's, I, I know something horrible is going to be there. I know something horrible is going to be there. And I'm, I'm trying to make myself look, and I finally get my eyes to focus on the mat. It's a blue-tailed skink. <laughs> he decided he was just going to curl right up next to me, and he was sitting right there, and usually they're very skittish, and they don't like to be messed with. This little guy, literally, I felt like he gave me a hug, and he was just, just chilling right there, you know, right next to my side. What was that? A blue-tailed what? A blue-tailed skink, and we, we've got... Skink? <laughs> what, 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 yeah. kind of, what kind of animal is that? I've never heard of that. It, it's some type of, like, lizard, amphib amphibious type lizard, and a I know... A reptilian. <laughs> there you go. They're Curl. beautiful, though. They're so, so pretty. So let me get this correct here. The queen of alabaster skin <laughs> was getting some sun, and a reptilian curled up next to her. <laughs> yes. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> it was beautiful. No, but, you know, but to me, the message behind that was, because I've always tended, I've always somehow wanted to, not wanted to, but tend to get nervous and worked up and upset with worry and it, like I, I get nervous and I get <laughs> scared. That's the Virgo in you. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, but see, this thing scares the hell out of me and then when I look down at it, it's just this beautiful little creature that just came over to say hello. It could have been worse. It could have been yep. something much worse, but it wasn't. It was just this little guy that just wanted to come up and say hi. So my message was that I got from that was you need to chill out. Mm -hmm. And not everything that you don't understand or don't know or can't see or or even understand is is a bad thing, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what I took from it. Yeah. <laughs> now, a friend of mine has been seeing hawks lately, and she was wondering what that meant. So I checked out a couple links on N5D and found out that the hawk means awareness and truth. And because the hawk has amazing eyesight, it represents opening your eyes and seeing that which is there to guide you. So mm -hmm. it's important to pay attention to any animal that comes into your life because there's always a lesson to learn from them. And I'd just like to remind everyone that our phone lines are open. If you have had any kind of paranormal experiences that you'd like to share with us, then give us a call at 646-716-8890. And I see one of our friends... And past guest, Sean Cohan, is here with us. Yay! So, so let's, let's bring Sean on the line, because I'm sure that she has lots of great stories for us. Hi, Sean. How are you? Hi, Greg. Hi, Kendra. How are you? Hey, Sean. Outstanding. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. As some of your uh, listeners might know, 
I'm in London, so it's it's a bit late here. It's the midnight hour here. Perfect time <laughs> to talk about paranormal stuff, right? Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. So okay, uh, what now, kind of experiences uh, have you had? I have a list. <laughs> a list. <laughs> All right. I have, I have it divided in three sections. Uh-huh. And um, the reason I say that is because some of your listeners might know that, you know, I'm a professional psychic and medium metaphysician. But I had a lot of these experiences before I ever became that. And uh, I think a lot of these experiences helped me to find that path, trying to understand what they were about, you know. And uh, one of the earliest experiences I ever had, a lot of my stuff used to come in dreams. So you were mentioning, Greg, dreams, right? Yeah. And uh, so before, way before um, I ever even knew I would become a psychic or even a medium, um, I wanted to go to Europe. One of my best girlfriends, I was 21, and, what, and I had stuff before, but I'm just going for a dream here. Um, and I was working and, uh, you know, wait, I was waitressing at the time, trying to get money together for, for college. And um, she had already gone over to Europe. I was in Pittsburgh at the time, where I'm from, Pennsylvania. And I was thinking, how could I get the money to go? I mean, it was un very unusual in 1977 to be going over to Europe, you know, so young. But we, we want, it was sort of the hippie trail. A lot of people were doing it, hitchhiking through Europe. And um, I thought, how can I get that money? And I had a dream. <laughs> I don't know where or how a voice came into my head and said, well, let's see, you have a car. Go to the bank and ask them if you can use the car to get money so you can go to Europe and meet your friend. And, you know, it never even dawned on me that you could do that. I had no idea whatsoever that you could do that. So I absolutely listened to the dream. I walked into my bank and I talked to the manager and I said, well, my father just bought me a new car, and I'm wondering, I'd like to kind of go to Europe. Is there any way? I didn't even know what it was called, you know, a loan on the car title. And um, the bank manager said to me, absolutely, how much would you like? And that's how I got the money together to go to Europe for six weeks. Was the uh, so bank manager's was, name, was the bank manager's was, name Satan? <laughs> The bank manager was a nice guy, and I had no idea what I was, you know, I wasn't very savvy on those things. Right. And it was, it was a direct message. Here's what you do. And because of that, one experience, is, I can tell you that's why I'm living in Europe today and have been here for 29 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, clearly I was meant to go. And the universe just conspired to give me the direct answer to do it. And I really walked in there, hand on my heart, I had no idea if this was even done. Because I was very naive about these things, okay? Mm -hmm. So that was that. And of course, I paid it off and got, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But, I mean, that was to get that huge sum of money at the time. Now, so that was one thing. I've had many, many, many experiences in my dreams. And... Uh, you know, I've been told about people who've died in my dreams, and I didn't know they were dead. So clearly those were visitations. Mm -hmm. But at the time, again, but this is before I became a professional psychic, I had no idea that um, spirit could do this or, you know, what it was about. Um, so I started the, one of the first, ports of calls, because my dreams were so active, was uh, me starting to really read books about my dreams and read them and understand them. And when they got to prophetic dreams, you know, that was, uh, again, we're going back into the 70s, so not a lot was written then. 
So really I had to find out myself. I just started taking a, a journal and keeping records of my dreams and dating them. And sure enough, I was, you know, I was having at least one, two a week that were showing me the future or predicting the future or showing me an incident that was coming up. So that's, that was really a big deal. Now, this is how powerful dreams can be. I had, so now go to uh, my daughter here in London. She was about nine years old, and she was at a sleepover party. And, uh, you know, I mean, this wasn't the first one she had, so I felt comfortable. I knew the people. You know, it was no big deal, really. I was, you know, happy she could have the experience. And in the middle of the night, I heard her little nine-year-old boy say to me, Mommy, can you come and get me? Hmm. Now, that's, that's, that made me sit up in my bed because I was asleep. Mm -hmm. And um, I said out loud, Why, honey, what's the matter? And I heard her voice say to me, Mommy, um, it, she used this name, Anastasia, which uh, I didn't know what this meant. Um, I was playing with Anastasia, and she jumped on me and knocked me over, and I hurt my arm. And, Mommy, will you come and get me? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, you know, is there really something wrong? If there was something wrong, wouldn't the parents call me? And I thought, maybe she's just a little scared. So I said, I just said out loud, honey, mommy will come and mommy will see you in the morning. I'm sure everything's fine, you know. Go back to sleep. Because I knew she was sending me this message in her sleep. In the morning, I called, and um, uh, that she was being brought home, and I met her at the bus stop where I was going to pick her up. And I said to her, honey, because I didn't want to alarm her, I said, is everything all right? She said, well, you know what happened, Mommy? The dog knocked me over, and I fell down, and I hurt my arm. And I said, honey, what's the dog's name? And the dog's name was not Anastasia. It was another name. I don't know why she used that. Maybe that was the dog soul's name. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it was really bizarre, really. I, I mean, that is amazing. For me, that was incredible, you know, because she was nine years old. And that was telepathy. She was sending me all that. And it was absolutely true. And I said to her, is your arm okay? She said, yeah, it's okay. But she banged it so it hurt her. And I said to her, why didn't you tell anyone? She said, I did tell them, but they thought it was all right. Aww. So... That's very strong telepathy between mother and child, and this happens, you know, quite a lot. With um, But for her to wake me up with their, her voice, I thought was very profound. Now, I have other things, too, like um, my mother lives in Florida, and I'm over here in the UK, and I had this dream a couple months back. This is eight months back, maybe. And I, I felt my mother's hands squeezing my shoulders and it woke me up and I knew somehow it was my mother and I said to myself what's wrong with my mother when you have older parents you're always concerned so I called the next day and it turned out that my mother had fallen and broken her hip and I did not know that but that was the message sent to me so, you know, it's, these, these are amazing experiences when, you know, if you don't know about them, how can they happen? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this is, the, mm -hmm. the message really is that we, we are all linked, you know, and our dreams are very powerful. Now, so that's, that's um, I wanted to share something that Kendra was talking about because um, I was working in London and I was taking these the tube station, which is our underground, but there are overground trains as well. And I was teaching one night, and I was coming back late, and I went on the platform, and I was waiting for a train. This was an overground train, so it was outside. And uh, there was this weirdo on the platform, and it was just 
just me and the weirdo, you know what I mean? And I started to get nervous because I could tell that, you know, I didn't feel safe. And I just sent a message to the universe, you know, protect me. The next thing I know, I turn around, and now the staircase was way far away. And there's a man standing there with a, a fedora hat on and a, and a coat, because it was winter time, it was cold. And he just looked at me, and he didn't say a word. And that weirdo who had been eyeing me up absolutely backed off. And I thought, well, at least there's another person on the platform. Then the train came. I got on the train, and I turned around as I sat down to look back, and he was completely gone, nowhere in sight. He did not get on the train because he would have gotten on the train exactly where I was. You know what I mean? He mm -hmm. would, I would have seen him running down the platform to catch another carriage, you know. So I had a very similar experience, you know, so I felt that definitely I was being protected there. Now, now you were talking about animals, you know. I had an experience, too, where my dog, from who was in the, in the States, we had a big old English sheepdog named Buttons. And um, one day I was here in London, and I was um, just laying down. I wasn't asleep. And I just had this strong feeling of buttons laying his head on my um, on my leg, and it was so strong. I just felt he was there. And um, at that point, I thought something's wrong with the dog. Something's wrong with the dog. And uh, anyway, it was very late at night, um, England time, so I had to wait till the next day. I called my mother. I said, what's wrong with the dog? And she said, oh, he's in the kennel. I had to go away for a couple of days, and I've just got back, and I haven't picked him up yet. So I said to her, oh, God, go get the dog. So clearly the dog, all the way over in England, call it astral projection, call it whatever you like, was letting me know that he was very unhappy and, you know, please come and get him. So these are just some of them. Now, those are pretty mild. Those are the easy ones. So now I'm going to give you some really amazing blow-your-mind ones, right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting off quiet and going to a roar here. So as I um, progressed in my metaphysical journey, um, things just got more crazy, really, to be honest. More crazy in a good way, I'd say, but... Uh, I could talk to you about, I moved into um, a flat with my daughter um, when she, actually she was born and we were in that flat, okay, I just got it right before I had her and I kept noticing at the time, you know, we lived in a neighborhood that 500,000 whatever years ago, everything in England is so old, you know, um, that it, it used to be a huge church area with... Um, bishops and monks and, you know, it was called, um, I mean, you know the famous Abbey Road from the Beatles, I don't live far from there, and the the reason that it's Abbey Road is because this whole area used to be one huge abbey, okay, and um, very interestingly enough, you know, I lived on a road called Priory Park Road, so a priory is similar to, you know, where the monks live, right? And um, so I had friends come and visit me and whatever, and whenever someone would come and visit me, if they slept in the, on the couch or in the living room, whatever, because it wasn't a big flat, um, people would <laughs> be woken up <laughs> by someone shaking their hand, right? And so they, uh, this was reported to me many times, and eventually I caught a glimpse of what looked like a monk, literally, with his hood up, right, and the long robe and the tie belt. And so from that, that point on, you know, all my friends and people who came, oh, how's the monk doing? You know, I was actually had a ghost of a monk living in my flat. 
So that was kind of bizarre, right? And, uh, you know, I just said to him, you know, you can stay here if you want. Obviously, he lived there first, do you understand, before it was bombed in World War II and they built a, a you know, or get, got rid of over the centuries and, and they built an apartment block there, you know. So I think one of the weirder things is um, that, you know, I, you, I'm sure you guys know I've seen a shadow person and so did my daughter. We both saw one at the same time, which really concurs that you're seeing them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, one ca we were in my bedroom, and it was daylight, daylight, yeah. And we were, I was sitting on the bed talking to my daughter, and the two of us just looked over across the room, and there he was. He walked through the wall with his, you know, he had on a, like a hat, and uh, looked like a long coat, you know, but all black, completely in shadow. It was like he took charcoal and just colored it all in. And I said, oh, my God. And, she, you know, at the time, I had never heard of them. And um, I, I thought, who the heck is that, you know, and went right through the wall, just passing through, you know. And uh, so it was only after that that I started to find out about them. Never seen one here again, you know, but definitely now understand that they do exist, right? And I have some great, um, I have some great angel ones. Would you like to hear those? Oh, definitely. Okay, so the first angel one, I mean, this is literally seeing angels, right? Um, I'm a big, I was a big, huge believer in them now. So this is after I've already done my metaphysics and worked with the, you know, the energy of archangels and what have you. But there was one particular time about, I'd say about 10, maybe 10 years ago, there was a person that I was trying to help. They were very, uh, you know, they had a lot of addiction issues. And I was very concerned about them. And I remember walking up the street. Uh, you know, my daughter was in school, and this was just someone I was, you know, trying to support through their process, whatever. And I was thinking, I hadn't heard from them, and I thought, my God, you know, I was just worried about them. And I walked up the street towards from where we live in our complex to there's a hill. So I was walking up this hill to get to the main road. And my head was down. I was looking at my feet, actually. And I kept thinking to myself, God, I wonder how he's doing. I hope he's all right. Bloody da dee da in my head. And I look just a glimpse up. And I just get this glow. And as I raise my eyes, there before me is a six-foot-tall angel with full wings, all in the most amazing colors. But as I caught his face, his face turned to my friend's face. It was like he didn't want me to see who he was. He wanted to make a message about this person that I cared about and was worried about. And he moved his hand, this angel, and there was a blue stream of light that followed his hand. And mm -hmm. I heard him say clearly in my head, you know he's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And I just stood there blinded, as you can imagine, you know, just gobsmacked. I was, oh, my God. And then, then he just faded away. So that was a very powerful experience, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, this, the color and energy was like nothing I've ever seen. I can't even describe it. And the wings. For people who think angels don't have wings, I definitely saw this one with wings. Wings spread out, too. So that was one. And I've also had um, messages come through. I have another one, the, an archangel one, which I'll save for the last one because it's probably the best one. But um, 
you know, I have a couple of boyfriends who passed away, and uh, this has been also been part of my process, working with their them on from a spirit level. And the one who died more recently, in 2004, um, is Art. And um, so Art was, uh, Art was a trickster when he was alive. <laughs> So it's no, it's really no surprise that he pulled every punch on me, every trick in the book. So one day after his passing, and it was coming up to Valentine's Day, I have I live on the ground floor apartment block, and there's about nine apartments on the floor on the bottom floor, so I'm just one of them. And I wasn't in here that long, maybe a year, so I didn't know my neighbors that well. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. It's coming up to Valentine's Day, but it was right after Art's birthday, because his birthday is February the 11th. So it's now like, you know, Valentine's Day is the 14th. And my neighbor knocks on my door, and she says to me, look, I have no idea why I'm here. She's got a bottle of pink champagne and two glasses. She says, I just feel that I should be drinking this with you. She had no idea I was mourning the death of one of my boyfriends. You know what I mean? And it was just amazing. <laughs> because, you know, Art, worked, Art and I met each other through work. He was a, managed a jazz nightclub, and I was a waitress and a bartender there. So, of course, it's pink champagne. You know what I mean? For Valentine's Day. So she definitely brought that over. She had no idea. When I told her the story, she absolutely, she said, oh, my, well, I guess this is for you. Come on, we'll have some, we'll, we'll celebrate Valentine's Day, right? So that was amazing. Then I had another experience where a neighbor of mine, this is a different neighbor, uh, this only happened a couple days ago. This is how much, you know, these are things that have been going on for years, but there's a na my next door neighbor. Not I was on Skype giving a reading. This was about five days ago, maybe a week ago. And the person I was giving a reading to lived in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I gave the reading. It was fine, no problem, and that was the end of that. Because of the 11-hour time difference between here and um, Hawaii, you know, I finished up at, in the evening. The next morning, there's a knock on my door, and it's my ne next-door neighbor, and she says, I have a message for you. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, Art woke me up three times to give me this message. And I said, what do you mean? She said, every time I went back to sleep, he kept waking me up. He said, look, this is Art. Right. Tell, her. Tell her it's Art because, and here's the proof, she was talking mm -hmm. to a lady in Hawaii last night, and the lady was having a hard time understanding her, but she got there in the end. And I was, I have to say, that really blew me away. There's no yeah. way she could have known that. And how many, I'm in London, England. Who the heck is on the phone to people in Hawaii? Do you know what I mean? Well, I was on Skype. So I said, well, clearly that's the matter. You know, right <laughs> the day before that, there was a shiny penny left. I went to take the rubbish, you know, the, put the garbage out, and I saw a penny right on my mat as if you would step out of your flat, there's your mat to wipe your feet on, and there's the penny. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up. And it had my daughter's birth year on it, 1996. Yeah, and I'm always looking at the dates on pennies, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have some kind of meaning to them. Yeah. Well, that was, I knew that. And guess what? Her and I were having some problems. So that was extremely significant to me. And I thought, let's see, who left this? Was this my dad? Was this Art? And then I got the message the next day about... <laughs> from my neighbor waking me up. How do you like that? That's amazing, isn't it? Well, okay. It seems like it seems like the spirits should have a little bit more understanding because they, they they apparently forgot what it's like to sleep here in, in interdimensional reality. 
<laughs> but you know, we're day, daytime. We're all so busy, and we're you know we're not tuned in as much. You know, when we sleep, we're already either astral projecting or we, the mind is quiet. And this is really one of the best times. I when I first started doing mediumship after Art died was really when my mediumship kicked in because before that I wasn't really that interested. I know it's hard to believe, but I wasn't. And. Um, I woke up in my bed. My bed, my bedroom was surrounded with spirits. I had spirits trying to reach me morning, noon, and night, but particularly at night. So I would be woken up to see children standing by my bed, um, people of all races and creeds and colors and religions standing by my bed. And I would think to them, and I would say to them, "What do you want?" And they knew they wanted me to help them. You know. And at the time, I was really struggling trying to understand it myself because I was trained in metaphysics. I was trained in psychic development. I was not trained in mediumship, even though I was clearly a natural medium. But I didn't, you know, I was processing all this stuff after our time. And he was clearly teaching me every little thing. And I'll tell you one other thing that was really amazing. I mean, they're all amazing, but... So what, I had this picture of Art from his boxing days, because he used to be a heavyweight boxer. And I, I had it. It was a black and white printed from a newspaper article photo. So it wasn't even a, a real photo. And this was, in England, we get a really late summer so that, you know, it gets dark about 1030 at night. And really early, early, like the light comes in about 4 o'clock in the morning. Starts getting, dawn hits about 4 or 4.30 in the morning over the summer. So again, this was after Art died. And I had this picture up uh, on my wall in my bedroom, uh, along with a, a couple other pictures. And uh, at the time, I was thinking, of, I was doing research for writing a book, so I had all these pictures up. And... I heard my daughter in the bedroom. That's what woke me up first in her bedroom. And I thought, oh, what's wrong? Maybe she doesn't feel well. And I heard her a couple times. And I thought, gee, what's going on here? So I went into my, her bedroom and I, I woke her up. I said, are you okay, honey? Do you want to come sleep with mommy? She was only nine or little, nine, ten, maybe, somewhere in there. So she said, okay, okay. So she came into my bedroom, right? And... Something happened at that point, and my eyesight started, I thought I was going blind. My eyesight started to fade. It was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. She's sleeping next to me. The light is shining in. Dawn is coming from the back of my bed, because the window's behind my bed, onto the wall where the picture is, and I'm trying to focus my eyes, and all of a sudden the picture starts to come alive. And I see okay. the, the picture animate itself. I, so Art's face is actually moving and he's, his eyes are rolling and he's, his eyebrows are going up and he's smiling and he's talking to me, but it's on a very higher vibration, like it, as if it's in not slow motion, but fast motion. Mm -hmm. And I could, I could make out certain words. I couldn't hear him, but I could make out certain words. Some of them were, I love you. Some of them are, keep smiling. You know, just things like that. And um, I was mesmerized. If there's really a word, it's mesmerized. Now, at the time, I didn't, had no idea that spirit could do this. This is actually called transfiguration. And it's a terminology that is used in uh, mediumship where a spirit can actually overlay itself over objects and come through, you know. But that is something I never heard of before. I mean, it sounds like a, it wasn't scary. It was delightful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he tried to teach me every which way that it could happen, you know what I mean, which um, I think was... Part of the reason he was with me for so long. He's still with me, as, as attested to Adrian, my neighbor, bringing that message. And there's so many more, but that's sort of, you know, that's sort of the, uh, that's, that's my sharing. 
<laughs> you know, you made a good point, too, about the spirits reaching us at night when we're sleeping or before we're about to go to sleep because our minds go into the alpha state, which is the best time to channel or to make a connection with these ent entities. I think that's correct, yeah. And if you mm -hmm. don't know that, you wonder... I mean, I know that... Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, they show a lot of this stuff in horror movies, don't they? So then people mm -hmm. get scared. <laughs> Excuse me. And because they have the, you know, this is how Hollywood makes its money, sadly. Uh, but, you know, if a spirit wakes you up, you know, we always say test the spirits. Ask who it is. Ask what do they want. I knew art, obviously, that was no problem, but the other ones, the children, that was really bizarre. I thought, why are they mm -hmm. here? There was a little black girl who clearly had her school uniform on. And I thought, either she lives in the building and she's astral projecting and she knows somehow they know you can see them, or she was lost, you know? And I do believe that, um, you know, we, that, that, that really lost spirits are watched over and, and took, taken to, the, to, you know, the astral plane, heaven, whatever you want to call it. I can't imagine that there's all these, but there is energy that resides, and then there are people that maybe refuse to go, you know. But how could a child or a baby, you know... So, I don't know, it brought up a lot of questions for me. It made me research and research and research some more. And I think this is how, on one level, at least in my world, you know, um, every single experience that happened to me, I didn't just leave alone. I did the research on it. And I think this is really my point, you know, to, if you want to know about these things, like I woke up one night, you were talking about animals coming to you, and there was a black panther with green eyes sleeping in my bed. <clears throat> oh, my I, gosh. I kid you not. I, at first, I, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, I woke up and I looked next to me and the thing was as long as me, you know. And I thought to myself, oh, my God. And then as I thought that, it kind of faded. And, you know, sometimes you think, am I going crazy? And then the other times you think, absolutely not. This is a totem animal. I, that's what I was saying about totems, you know, like spirit animals come to us. And, um, you know, at the time I was doing a lot of research. And you think about a black panther, smooth and sleek and, you know, seeking out things. I don't know. That's the opinion. But the green eyes showing up to me, you know, it turned its head and looked me straight in the face as I turned to look at it, you know. So um, my last little story is about Archangel Michael. Would you like to hear that one? And then I, I, I don't want to take up too much time. So... Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay, so you know, in, when when you when you train in metaphysics, obviously you learn things that working with angels, different levels of angels, and the archangels particularly are, you know, they're the most beautiful benevolent energies. I don't know how else to call them, and um, they are messengers from God, just like any angel, but. Archangel Michael is particularly strong because he rules over the earth uh, and he assists people in many areas, not just one or two. So I worked with Archangel Michael when I was a student nurse and Archangel Raphael a lot. I shared this when I was on your show. Um, so he's not unfamiliar to me, right? And while I, you know, I always say that light workers work under, like he's our boss. If you're a light worker, you're working for the Archangel Michael, you know, basically. I mean, this has been said to, to me by so many light workers across the world. I've met people in Israel, Cyprus, Italy, you know, Ireland, you name it, who say, well, I always feel Archangel Michael's my boss, you know. <laughs> so... If I need clients, I just ask Archangel Michael, you know, or whatever. But, of course, Michael is very much used for protection. You know, if you are scared or you're not sure, you call on Archangel Michael. 
Right. And they say that his sword defeats and cuts away all negativity, right? So in this process of grief that happened to me with this, the, you know, with Art, with this old boyfriend of mine, and, you know, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of spiritual stuff happening that I, even I, after all my training, didn't really understand, and I was trying to understand. And I had a lot of pressure on me. I was working, single parent. Yeah, I had a lot of other things to do. So to take the time to actually work through this stuff was, it, you know, it was an effort. It wasn't easy. But um, there was one particular day I was feeling grief. When somebody dies, just because you know about it or you might know about the, the other planes doesn't mean that you don't experience grief. And I think mostly grief is for us. It's not for them. You know, they're okay. So mm -hmm. there was... One particular day, I was trying to understand, because Art and I tried to get back together in 1994, and it didn't work out. Okay, so it was like, well, if he loved me so much, and he's come back to tell me, I don't understand. You know, I tried to get back together with him at that time. I mean, what was, I was trying to understand the karma involved, or, you know, why this experience didn't gel when it had opportunity to. You know, if we, especially since we both wanted it, you know. Anyway, I was feeling very sad and very sorry for myself and very, you know, uh, emotional. And I spent, and my daughter was at school and I spent the afternoon just away from all my work and I just had a good cry. And I was crying pretty good. And um, I had my, I was sitting on my couch and I had my head pretty much in my hand, sobbing. And I heard this voice as loud as I'm speaking to you that you can hear my voice. Turn on the TV. <laughs> and I stopped in my tracks and I thought, what? And I ignored it because I thought, why, what? Why did I hear that? And as I sort of went back into my, you know, sadness, I heard this voice again, only louder. I am Michael. Turn on the TV. Now, some of you may know that when Archangel Michael shows up, that's how he pronounce. That's how he greets you. I am Michael. Those are his words. And. I went, oh, my God. And I got really scared, you know, just really nervous. Because I thought, wow. And I thought, okay, I'll turn on the TV. Why does he want me to turn on the TV? I never watch TV during the day. Never. So I turned it on. I didn't change the channel. I didn't manipulate the dials. I just put the TV on. And what do you think was on the TV at that moment? All in the family. It, no. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> no, it was, it was the movie Michael, starring uh, John. Oh, wow. What's his name? John, I forget. Uh, huh? Travolta. John Travolta. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And there he is in his, in, you know, with his wings, because, you know, John Travolta plays Michael, and he's got his coat on and his wings, and I couldn't believe it. You know, I was gobsmacked, and I heard Michael say to me, could feel his energy to my right. He's trying to prove to me it's him. Clearly he did, right? And... Uh, and I got very humbled, you know, because I thought, my God, why is he here? And he said, and he talked to me for 20 minutes. And here's, I'll just make it brief. Basically, here's what he said to me. He said to me, everything that has happened has happened for a reason. And you are not alone. And you will definitely be with your loved one again. And I can promise you that. And I just started crying, and he, I said to him, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I failed, because somehow, you know, 
I missed out on the love of my life. And he says to me, there's no failure. Failure is an illusion of this world. There is no wrong and there is no right. This is all an illusion. There's no black, there's no white. There are only experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time in my entire life that I had ever heard that. Because, you know, you think, oh, you're fighting for the good, you're doing the good work, you want to be a good person, you know, you're a spiritual person, therefore you're a good person. I never heard that. I don't know why I never heard it before, but clearly he said it to me. There, are no, there is no failure. There, is, oh, there are only experiences. And failure is an illusion in, in this world. You know, that's, part of the, uh, Ros that's part of the Rosicrucia teachings where they say that you know, happiness isn't an emotion. You, the, your goal in life should be to experience as much as you can, and within those experiences you'll find happiness. Well, I think he was also saying, because I think, you, you know, when you, you know, I had had a career in metaphysics and I was a psychic, and yet I didn't know that this man still loved me all these years, you know, had gone by, and, and I felt that I had failed, you know, all that knowledge, and somehow I missed out on that personal happiness. Of course, Art had his own issues, you know, it wasn't just me, but, and I felt, I was feeling very sorry for myself, you know, I was. And um, he went through a whole backlog of events that happened in my life. And um, he said, do you remember when you met, you were first introduced to me, because I wasn't raised a Catholic. I had no idea about the Archangel Michael. I was raised a Jew, you know, and it, it just never came up. And I wasn't very religious anyway, you know, so... When I got to metaphysics school, that's when I learned about the archangels. And um, he said, do you remember when you were introduced to me? I mean, imagine that. That was many years before. I said, yes. And he said, and do you remember how you were learning metaphysics? And I said, yes. And do you remember when you were a student nurse and you used to call upon me and Archangel Raphael to help you? I said, yes. And he said, do you, you know, I've been with your family a long time and I will always be with them. And when he said that, I was really surprised because I thought, my God, my family and I have been through so many things. But what he meant by that, I think, was that, you know, we're all protected. We're all looked after, whether we know it or not, whether we go through hell on earth or not, you know, whether we go through experiences that are tragic, horrible, you know, you wouldn't want to wish on your worst enemy you're still protected. And that's the feeling that I got. You know, so that was one of the most profound, beautiful experiences I have ever had in my life. And um, he, he left me saying, you know, d you know d be, be of good cheer, he said to me, and be brave. And everything's going to be all right. And that was it. And then he was gone. So I'll, I'll leave you with that wondrous message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are some amazing stories, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing them with us and our N5D family. Yeah, You're very you. welcome. I, and I, I would say that that message from Archangel Michael is for everyone. It's for everyone. Okay? All righty. Thanks, Sean. Okay, right. my love. I will be listening. I'm still listening, so I'll hang up on the Skype now. And thank you for Alrighty. letting me share this. Thank Bye you, now. Sean. Take care now. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. All that was missing was a campfire and some marshmallows. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about dreams is that once you eliminate the fear from your daily routine, then your dreams become more prophetic. You know, our, and I, I've always believed this, that our dreams are the closest we'll get to our true spiritual reality because we escape the illusion of time. In your dreams, you, you never know what day it is or what time it is, and that, my friends, is what it's like on the other side where time does not exist. Yeah, uh, it's very, very amazing. Um, 
it, you know, when you when you cross over into that to that dream state and and you're there, you know, I mean, that that is just like you said, that is the closest that that you can get. I mean, and it, even though sometimes you wake up and you're like, what the hell was that all about? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's it's still, you know. Um, it's, it's amazing how our minds work and how everything comes together cohesively and creates this body and spirit and soul that, that's us, you know? It's mm -hmm. awesome. Wonderful. I, I remember hearing this story, and I, there's an article and a video on N5D. It's from this guy named Hugh Mann, H-U-G-H-M-A-N. And he was approached by this old man who looked very poor and was missing a few teeth. Anyways, he had this great conversation with this guy for about 10 minutes. And after they finished their conversation, they walked away from each other. And the old man asked Hugh, what's your name? So Hugh turns around to shake his hand. And he was looking at the face of a, like a 28-year-old with perfect teeth. So oh, you just, wow. yeah, you, that gave me like goosebumps and made the hair stand <laughs> up on my arms when I, when I heard that. It was like, you just never know you know, where these human angels are and who, you, who when the next time you talk to somebody, if that is one or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I had a really good friend of mine. Um, he used to be a paranormal investigator, and I went with her on several of her, you know, cases that she would get called to do. And my, my job was to basically do clearings. Um, if she felt or if we, any of us felt like there was any kind of negative energy around, my job was to kind of try to clear that out and to, uh, to you know, just um, bring a little bit of a, a positive um, energy back into the, into the home or the business or wherever, we're, wherever we were. But the most intriguing aspect of all of that for me, honestly, were the EVPs. And, you know, I wish I could say that, you know, all the voices that were captured, um, you know, on the, on the tape were friendly, but in a lot of cases, they, were, they, they weren't. I mean, mm -hmm. they, we, we either caught things that were cussing at us or they sounded like they were frustrated or sad. And I've often wondered why. And, and you know, I mean, it would be nice to have, you know, like, um, hey, everything's wonderful on this side. You've got nothing to worry about. We love you, you know, and stuff like that. But... Um, you know, we were getting things like, you know, go away or, you know, mess with me and that's what you'll get and other choice phrases, you know, that I recall hearing on tape. But I have often wondered, it's like, you know, what is that dimension that we're tapping into? Where do all of these parallels come into, into play? It, do, or there, is there a realm or, or a space between where these more negative discarnate energies exist? And that's what what we're tapping into. It's it's like you know the paranormal can range from the, you know these benevolent, amazing experiences to these malevolent experiences where and even in 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 you know from angels to like stuff that you just don't really quite understand at all. Like what is it? Like shadow people, you know? Uh -huh. and that's not a ghost. It's not an alien. It, it's it's a shadow person. It just makes you wonder what. All this, is, I mean, there's so much going on out there, and 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 all of these realms in between the one that we're you know living in right now, just fascinates me. It really does. You know, I, I recently, maybe a month or two ago, I had that article on N5D about shadow people, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a guy on there that by the name of Harley Swift Deer Reagan. Uh, I guess he goes by the name of Thunderstrikes in this uh, interview that he had with Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM. And he said that shadow people are parallel dimensional beings um, that were first recorded by indigenous people back in the year of 1153 BC. And he said that there's a, there was an awakening that, that was going on from 1980 through 2000. And beginning in 2001, there began what, what he called the quickening, in which events and time seems to be speeding up. And as this, is occur as this is occurring, shadow people are becoming more visible as frequencies raise. So that's kind of similar to what you were saying. You know, maybe yeah. the changes in dimensions and just what the energies are happening right now, it's making these paranormal events and activities and phenomenon appear to us more so than ever before. Yeah, the piercing of the veil. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. So we got the ancient boogeyman, shadow person, people coming back. So, well, it, it's interesting. It really is. And you know, and and like I, you know, it's sad because Hollywood has tainted the paranormal so badly with all of the, 
the fear propaganda. It's always, you know, I mean, these movies are just ridiculous. And yeah, I know that there's things that happen out there that, uh, you know, are a little bit on the creepy side. But, um, you know, I also think, too, that, you know, a lot of seeds have been planted um, for these things to, to kind of, you know, take shape a little bit easier. So, I mean, Greg, do you think that a person can actually, you know, induce a paranormal experience just by thinking or, you know, just by thinking of something? You know, I was, I was just reading an article on Ormus, monatomic gold, mm -hmm. because I just bought a bottle of it and I wasn't sure what to expect. But one of the articles I read stated that monatomic gold helps you induce manifestations as well as UFOs. So I thought, that was pretty cool. But as for manifesting par paranormal experiences, as long as you're open to the possibility for these experiences to happen in your life, and you're in your life, then definitely. I think that for, for many of us who have seen UFOs, we've asked for them to appear to us, and we show no fear when they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, and I've, I've always been told when I was younger, I remember this, you know, oh, it's just your imagination, it's just your imagination. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, but it, it might be my imagination, but it's real to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's real to me. So it's like if I'm, I'm either creating it myself or I'm opening the doorway for something to come through that uh, that's taken, you know, that, that's, you know, using that and taking me for a ride just because, you know, I'm feeding whatever it needs to, to, to turn into something. So, uh, yeah, it, you know, the paranormal definitely has uh, influenced humanity tremendously throughout the ages. I mean, everything from angels to ghosts, aliens to demons. Um, I mean, even we've got re religions and cultures based on it. So it's, it's really uh, it's something to definitely take note of. Now, for the, you know, vast majority um, of people, you know, Bigfoot and... We've got, uh, oh my goodness, thing, the Mothman, Bigfoot, but a lot of it is also based around UFOs. And I, I found a website, um, actually two, which, which I thought were really, really cool. Um, you probably already heard of it, but uh, it's the, the NUFORC.org website. It's the National UFO Reporting Center. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really cool because when you look at this website, I love how it's put together. It's so organized. Um, a Virgo must have done it. <laughs> but anyway, it was interesting because there's a pattern of UFO sightings, and you can see where it's increased drastically, of course, since the 1960s and even earlier. But then all of a sudden in 1995, you see this big pop um, of, uh, of sightings. And then July 2012 and July 2013 seems to have been like this exceptional active period because the number of reported UFOs broke the 900 mark. So, I mean, I don't know what it is about July, but it looks like the UFOs really like the hot weather. So um, I also thought it was interesting because most of these reports are coming out of Washington State. And, you know, and, and I've also noticed that on the other website that uh, people are, you know, using to report Bigfoot sightings, the majority of those Bigfoot sightings are also from Washington State. So it's like, what's going on in Washington, you know? Huh. Well, yeah. it makes you wonder if a portal or a stargate opened around July or August. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I just thought that was really interesting to see how big of a, an increase in activity there was because it went from like five or 600 reports to, boom, 900 and, you know, even broke the 900 mark in those uh, two particular months or in that, you know, in the in 2012 July and also uh, 2013 in July. Mm. But um, I just thought it was interesting. And guess which place comes uh, second um, in the world for uh, uh, Bigfoot sightings? Florida? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I think I saw him on a surfboard. No, not even Oregon. Not even Oregon. <laughs> yeah. Washington State's next door neighbor, but you know, I mean, Florida. Wow, <laughs> he must be awful hot, you know, with all that fur. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of manifesting, you recently had a solar return reading from Lavendar, so you're going to be doing some manifesting here. Oh yeah, and I, you know, um, that was um, a, a wonderful gift uh, from a very, very special, special person, and you know who that is. So, um, I was, it was a wonderful experience. I would suggest anybody that's looking into any type of 
you know, birthday gift to give to somebody or just, you know, um, something that they can give to themselves, the solar return charts are powerful. They are so powerful. I had no idea um, the manifestation uh, power behind, you know, your solar return, you know, that those 10 hours of power that you have um, to manifest just about anything that you want for that upcoming year. It was amazing. And, um, you know, Lavendar from the uh, Starseed Hotline, she was phenomenal. phenomenal. She answered a, so many questions for me, validated so much for me. It, it was one of the best gifts I've ever had. It was it was wonderful. Uh, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> now, I remember doing a third eye mirror meditation. And I have this on uh, N5D. Just click on the meditation link at the top of the page, and it should be right there. So, you know, this is a meditation where you light a candle and you focus on the reflection of your third eye in the mirror. And what's going to happen is that you'll see yourself change into many different people, both male and female. And I should tell everyone that this is not a beginner's meditation because sometimes <laughs> you're going to see things that aren't so pleasant. So I was yeah. doing... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I was doing this meditation a few years ago, and I saw myself change into all these different people. And then, all of a sudden, I saw this reflection of this hideous monster-like creature with red eyes and long white fangs. And I don't know if, it, if this was an aspect of myself, because I'm, we, we, we had to be everything and anything at this point in our lives. So, you know, including the good, the bad, and the fugly in, in this case. <laughs> Or, or if it was a demonic entity that used the mirror as a portal. And I also wondered if this was the universe testing me to see if I could handle a situ situation like this. And I think if that was the case, I handled it with flying colors because what I did was I calmly told this entity that it was not welcome here and I asked it to leave. Then I reprotected myself in my room with white light and, and continued the meditation. Now. I'm thinking in retrospect that I should have asked that, that demonic creature why it was there and if there was anything I could do to help it on its journey. So have, have you had any experiences like that with a third eye mirror meditation? You know, that was one of the things uh, that I, uh, one of the first types of meditation that I was introduced to as a kid. Um, my mom and I actually started doing the third eye med mirror meditation um, quite a few years ago. And I don't re you know, I, I've seen some things in the mirror because basically what it was with us was we were actually trying to see past lives in, in the mirror, you know, or, or where your face actually changes and you can start to see, you know, the, the, the faces of, you know, your past life experiences. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't recall really ever, <laughs> you know, there, there's a few things that stick out in my mind, I, but the, the majority of the faces that were coming through were, were really, really ugly. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I know that sounds terrible, but, you know, um, they were just not very pleasant to look at. Um, they, they just didn't seem like, um, not, not evil or anything, but just, just not what I would have expected, you know. And, and it was interesting, too, with, with the third eye um, meditation. It's not only, the, I mean, it was actual skin color changes skin color, bone structure, mm -hmm. um, things that you just can't, you know. Length of hair. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, it, it was just completely and totally different people looking at you, directly coming back, you know, in your, right in front of you, your face. So it's yep. like, it, it really blows you away. Um, and I would suggest it for, like you say, somebody that might be a little bit more advanced um, with, with meditation, a little bit more open and not, you know, because fear does, does, definitely doesn't uh, help when you do that kind of stuff. <laughs> nope. So, no, it does not. And, it, and if anything, it would probably open up a, a door for something else to maybe possibly come through and just, you know, just as a joke or to, to mess with you. But, um, you know, what I've often wondered is is the significance of the mirror because mirrors have always kind of had a, a hint of mysticism yeah. around them to begin with. So it's like, could these possibly be used as portals? You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, back in you know ancient times and stuff, 
I mean, I don't know how far back. I don't know the history of it, you know, to give a date, but I know that only royalty were, were even allowed to have mirrors at one point in time. Oh, yeah, a mirror, mirror on the wall. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty interesting, pretty cool stuff. <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I, and for people out there that are thinking about doing it, you better be damn sure that this is something you want to do and be spiritually ready to see anything because anything and everything is going to happen. And I would not recommend this to the novice person that's just beginning meditating. Be sure that you're comfortable within, your, and within yourself and uh, with what might appear in front of you. And always, always, always protect yourself spiritually beforehand. Um, and all you need to do is envision this white light emanating from your center and expanding outwards. And what I end up doing is I expand it outwards in my, uh, in my body, and then I cover the room. I cover my house, my neighborhood, my, my state. I, and I carry it out as far to the cover the globe, the, the galaxy, the universe. You can carry that white light out as far as you want. And, you know, the further the better because you're really protecting everyone. But once you finally get to that point of where you feel comfortable, um, yeah, you can begin your meditation. And don't be surprised at what you might see because you're going to see some really strange stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see that we have another caller that, whose number looks very familiar, Kendra. Yes, yes it does. <laughs> 870, you're, you're on N5D Radio <laughs> with Greg, Greg and Kendra. Hello, my Hi, Greg. Hi, Hi Monty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great show. I'm enjoying everything. Uh, oh, I've, I've got so many things that you know, Kendra, that I, I, I had a hard time deciding what to even say. But uh, I know. from the time I was, from, you, oh, you know, from the time I was a little, <laughs> <laughs> from the time I was a little girl, you know, I had all kinds of visions, dreams, and strange things, well, unusual things, things that don't happen to other people as a rule. But I would always dream if someone in the in the family was going to die, I would see their death before it happened. And I tell people nobody wanted to believe me. And that is very upsetting. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was uh, 12 years old, I believe it was 1958. Um, I had I I was standing in my bedroom. This is in a dream, and I'm I'm looking into my room, and on my bed there were these five mannequins laying across my bed. The one in the middle was like a big man, and then he had two younger people on each side of him. One was real young, but they were just mannequins. They and you, you. There were no, there were no clothes on them. They were just like the bodies, like you know, with no. Um, they weren't generically uh, accurate or anything, or however you put it. But uh, I could tell the one in the middle was a big man. Well, I took it the next day. I told my mother and father five people we know are going to die, and I was very upset. And they wouldn't believe me. They were telling me it's just a dream. Don't, don't think anything of it. I kept insisting and I was upset for three days crying and I couldn't get it out of my mind. So I was down with my father in the in the dentist's office and we heard sirens and my father said, I don't like the direction they're going in. We got home and we, we found out that the five people that we knew that lived up the street from us had all died from carbon monoxide poisoning in their house. Wow. And when they were very close to us because my mother was babysitting them. But the father died and the baby, little Joey, and his older brother, uh, or his younger brother, Billy, the little one, and then his sister, Sherry, and his other older sister, Ruthie, they were all dead. So uh, I've often wondered, you know, why did I see those things? But as years went on, I realized it wasn't to torture me or to give me a, or, you know, a fear, but it was... I was being convinced from a very young age that spirit is real, you know, that these things really occur and, and to prepare me for realizing these things and to be able to be accustomed to them and not be afraid of them. But I saw my grandfather the night before he died. We had no telephone in the house and I knew something had happened to my grandfather. I seen him laying in his bed in the nursing home where he was living. He was all hooked up with hoses all over his face, up his nose, and all like the tubes and everything. And he had had a stroke that night, and he died the next day. And then when the night before my grandmother died, I saw it like an apricot colored cloud come floating towards me as I was laying in my bed. And I looked at it, and it was my, my father's face. 
and his mother died the next morning. We found out. So Do me a favor. Things happen. Yes? Do me a favor. Don't don't dream about me. <laughs> okay. Well, and if you do, don't say anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Well, can you know if I've told her this, that in 1998, I had a dream. I was in Manhattan. I was walking down the street. I was familiar with New York because I was born and raised upstate New York. And I was walking through Manhattan, and a big, long, black Cadillac car pulled up alongside me like a limousine. And a young blonde woman got out, and she came running over to me. And she said, there's going to be a bloodbath. They want to kill us all. And that's all she said. And when I looked up, I saw the Twin Tower buildings, and I seen them burst into thick black building smoke, and I seen them implode exactly the, the way they did on 911. Wow. I didn't. I had never saw those buildings because I left up. I left the north in 1972, and that's the year that those buildings were finished building, and I never saw them finished. And I didn't even know what I'd seen. You Pardon? need some happy par. You need some happy paranormal experiences in your life. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got one story I'm going to let Kendra tell you. She'll know what I'm talking about. Remember the blue dress, Kendra? Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and? That was one of the strangest things that happened. But I've always prayed whenever I had to put Kendra on a plane to go down and see her father in Florida because we lived in Arkansas. And I had to do that from the time she was about five. And I used to worry. And I'd have to, you know, have an escort with her and everything. And we would pray for angels. Mm -hmm. One time before she was going to take the flight, we were sitting in the living room, and we had just finished praying, and I looked at Kendra out sideways out of the corner of my eye, and I had this strange feeling not to look up, that something was like something that was like sacred in the room or something. It was a very odd, warm feeling, a good feeling. And I looked at her, and she started having tears come down her face, and her, she had her finger out, and she's pointing at the wall across from us. And she says, Mommy, Mommy, a beautiful angel, the most beautiful angel. And she starts describing this angel, telling me about his blue eyes, his blonde hair, and the beautiful wings and everything. And then I seen her eyes. I wouldn't look because I knew it was for her and not me. And I seen her eyes follow this up, up the wall, and she said, Oh, he's gone. Well, I took my camera with me when I went to the airport. And I stood there at the uh, window looking out at the plane she got on after she boarded. And I've always prayed for angels to be around Kendra to protect her. And I took a picture. And in this picture, you can see white columns, kind of fuzzy and faded, but they're all around the plane she's on. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can see them in the picture. And I always said those were her angels. Well, I think your prayers have been answered. She has lots of angels around her. <laughs> oh, I know. I know about that incident that happened with her and her friend in Tampa. That was really something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask you to, to, to uh, maybe give w one uh, experience that I know um, would be very intriguing for a lot of people? Um, it was when you when you seen the Egyptian man walking across the living room through oh, the portal. Oh, I didn't have that one written down to tell. Sure, yeah. Oh, my. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I had always uh, just randomly picked up my Bible whenever I had a really deep problem that I wanted the answers to. And I would, whatever my eyes fell on, that would always be what I was looking for, the answer I needed. So this was right at the outset of the first uh, desert, desert storm, the first war over there in Iraq. And I was worried because we had a lot of family members that were in the military, and I was afraid they'd have to go and something bad would happen. So I was praying and crying. Tears were coming down my face. I mean, I was a mess. I got up, walked across the room, and I got my Bible, took it off the shelf. And when I turned around, I was standing in front of the picture window on our house. But in front of me, sideways, in front of that window, another window opened up. And it was a window to another reality. I was in the desert. I was in Cairo looking at the pyramids, the sand, the Sphinx. I, mean, I was there. All of a sudden, I saw the Sphinx start to move. 
and it stood up and it started walking towards me and it was absolutely fabulous, beautiful. Copper colored skin, had a mane, had a tail. The headdress was blue and white stripe and had the serpent thing in the middle like it does on the sinks. The wine cloth matched the headdress with the blue and white stripes. And it walked towards me and then it, I wanted to step into it, but something was telling me not to, that I would be going into another reality and I might not be able to get out. <laughs> and he just looked at me and was, when he looked up at me, our eyes met, and he looked, I didn't hear a thing, but he looked to me like he had screamed, like he was as shocked as I was. Mm-hmm. And then he just walked on his way, and I watched him go off on the sand. And there is so much more, so so much that goes into that. Other things that happen later on that there's no time to tell, but it's amazing. And uh, you, you've always ahead, had, um, you've always had a lot of um, experiences that, to me, just seemed like um, I don't know. Just well, I used to do I, time I, I mean, years ago that were very accurate, and I probably should have stuck with that, but I. I never, you know, I never charged money for anything. I I did a lot of really accurate, amazing readings. But then I had a, I had a very best friend down in Florida. I mean, we did everything together. We went to real estate school to get together in sewing classes. And, I mean, we were very close. She was killed in a car accident. She was living in Florida. And I was in Arkansas already. And one day I was out in the kitchen with my husband, and we're not married now, but he asked me. We were standing back to back in the kitchen. I was doing something on the counter on one side, and he was doing something on the counter behind me. And he asked me to hand him a lid for a pan that he needed. So I I picked it up, and I just held it back to him, and I felt him take it out of my hand. A few minutes later, he said to me, could I have that lid? And I said... I said, yeah. I said, I already gave it to you. He said, no, you didn't. I said, yeah, I did a few minutes ago. You took it. And all of a sudden, I heard this laughter. And it was my friend Gracie I recognized. She was as plain as anything. It was her. (laughs) It was just really strange. And sure enough, the lid was sitting next to him. He didn't even say it. It was was sitting there. Then he realized what happened. He didn't put it there. He said he never took it. Then one day, uh, that same tender stepdad and I were up on, we walked up Mount Ida here in Arkansas. And we went up to the top of the mountain. We we used to like to go crystal digging. I had had a um, rash on my left foot that was just terrible for years. The doctors tried all kinds of creams on it. It wouldn't go away. It started with some kind of a bacteria. When I was 16 years old, I got a little cut and something got into it. And it would drive me crazy, itching and red and would get watery and awful. Well, I tried everything. I'm up here on the mountain and I'm digging for crystals. And on the side of the the cliff, I ran into a whole line of this beautiful colored clay. It It was layers of pastel colors, yellow and pink and green and blue. I never even knew something like that existed. And all of a sudden... I heard an audible voice, and it said, take off your shoe and your sock. And I recognized the voice. I had heard it before. So I took off my shoe and my sock. And it said, now, take some of the clay and put it on your toes. So I did. Then I put my sock back on and my shoe. And I didn't think anything more of it, but I, I had a feeling. But when we got home that night, I took off my shoe and my sock. And that rash was totally gone, along with all of the scars that I had had from all the scratching and digging I had done on it for all those years. It you said gone. that you recognized the voice. Who was that voice? Yes. Yes, I've heard who it was, before. Who was it? It was. It's a male, gentle voice. And I, I, I said... He never, I know, he never I mean, identified himself, though, right? No, never said who he was. Mm-hmm. All I can think of, it has to be a guide. It has to be my, one of my guides or a guide. Mm-hmm. I remember I was, I was burning 
garbage one time, and I was all by myself in an area of Tinder remembers. You could turn around 360 degrees, and you wouldn't see another house. I was all by myself, <laughs> and I heard a voice, the same voice, come out of, over my head and says, I have made many concessions towards you. Now what will you do about it? And I just looked up. I said, is that you, Lord? And I never heard another thing. But that is uh -huh. just, I mean, so many UFO experiences and ET experiences. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it and heard it all, just about all of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really makes you, uh, it really makes you uh, question, you know, the reality that we live in and, you know, what the meaning of all this is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Well, it just helped me well, to realize there's a whole lot more to life than, than what we see and what we realize. Absolutely. <laughs> I have to agree with you on that one. <laughs> and, uh, Ken, I took pictures of Kendra before she got on the airplane one day. She got all her, herself all dressed up, put on her one and only beautiful blue dress, which looked really pretty on her. I took pictures of her. We took her to the airport. I took another picture of her there at the airport in the blue dress. She got on the plane. The plane left, went down to Florida. I went back home, and the next day I was going through her closet, and the blue dress was hanging in her closet. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I remember I that. Have no I, idea. I was actually, I was really upset that that dress wasn't, uh, <laughs> I was looking for it. I was going to wear it. I was like, where's my dress? Oh, it's back in our You never car. did tell me what in the world you had on on that plane because you left the blue dress on. <laughs> and that was the last time Kendra. That was the last time Kendra wore a dress. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That ruined it. That, that ruined it for me there. Uh, well, Mom, I know between the, between all of the memories and everything between the two of us and everything, we could probably fill up uh, an entire you know twenty four oh, hour yes, you know, yes. period. Right, but. I, I just I'm, I thank you for calling, and I really appreciate it. And some of those stories have helped formulate who I am today and mold me into who I Absolutely. am today. A lot of it was yeah, a little, little creepy, but uh, well, actually, a lot of it was a little creepy. But um, and when yeah, we know. when we did that third eye meditation, you saw some of the faces that changed for me, and I saw some of the ones that changed for you because I remember we talked about it and saw the same exact thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually a really good point to make about the third eye, um, the mirror meditation, is if you do it with mm -hmm. somebody else, um, it does mm -hmm. work. The, the person that's yeah. looking in the mirror with you will validate for you what you're seeing and vice versa. At least it did for us. I remember that completely. Yeah, and we've both yeah. seen ourselves change as cat people. Yeah. you remember yep, that? I remember the cat And that, that ties in with the lion man uh who I've come to realize now was Vishnu and and uh, Narishima, the Sphinx, which which I believe was built to honor Narishima and this who was one of Vishnu's uh, I think it was either his fifth or sixth avatar. Mm -hmm. And that's that ties in with the Indian people. Yep. Awesome awesome inform I mean you you really can get a lot from that. That's probably one of my most favorite um a medita meditations. It's really, it's fun. Oh, it's, yeah. You know, something you can do with somebody else and actually really see and experience something that uh, you can, you know, really yeah, run with. Yeah, we'll have to try that again sometime. <laughs> yep, that'd be nice. Well, Mom, thanks for calling. Okay, I really baby. appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It was fun. Okay. All right. Uh huh. Take now care. Stay. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. You know, speaking of meditating, I was doing the third eye meditation one time. And uh, it was just when I first started, so nothing had really transformed at that point. But what I saw was this huge orange orb over my left shoulder. Okay. And uh, the, the first thing I, looked, I, I thought about was when I got done with the med med meditation was, what does that mean? And I looked it up, and when you see an orange orb, it's a symbol of comfort, healing, energy, healing energy, motivation, hope, strength, and courage. So... Yeah, and, and, and the odd thing, too, is that one time I was uh, at my computer, and I'm just, I'm just uh, working on it, and this is maybe four or five years ago, 
and my dog, my German Shepherd, was laying nearby me. And uh, I remember there was an orb that I caught out of the corner of my eye, and I turned my head to see it. My dog lifted his head up to see it as well, and the orb shot up the staircase. And my, my, I know my eyes followed it, but I could see that my dog's head also followed the orb going up my, my staircase, and I thought that was really amazing. Um, so I was wondering, maybe, uh, Kendra, if you or any of our listeners had any experiences with orbs or anything like that. Are you there, Kendra? Oops, oops, I was on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I have, I've seen what I believe may have been orbs in the past out of the corner of my eye, you know, um, and, but you know, it's funny, I, I actually managed to capture what I really think is an orb on my webcam, um, and, you know, and I, I feel really silly posting it because at the time, I mean, I was, I was with my dog and I didn't really ever think anybody was ever going to see this video, so I was playing with them, and I sound like a complete idiot. <laughs> but right in the middle of the video, you see this orb-like like object with a in, like it with a trajectory um, fly right past me and my dog. And you know, I don't know if 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 that is an orb or or if it was just something else, you know, in, a, in another parallel you know dimension or whatever, but. I thought it was pretty interesting. I put it on YouTube for a little while, and then I took it back down because I just couldn't get over the fact that I sounded so stupid. Aww. <laughs> My dog. <laughs> no, I, I think you should have left it up there because a lot of people would have related to what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'll probably go ahead and, and post it again. But it, it's very, it, it, it was interesting to me because it, it's almost like it came out of, it's almost like you can see it coming in and going back out of, the the ability to, for the camera to you know the perception from the camera like you know in and out of those dimensions where you know you're in the realm of visibility to to the the camera and to the you know the naked eye and then and then you go back out it's, it was really interesting to me yeah and and you know what else I find is really cool about these orbs is when you get those really good quality photos of them mm -hmm. you know how they look like they have like rings within rings within rings like the like the rings of trees. Have you noticed that? Sometimes, yeah. It, it's it's really interesting to me because I always when when you get those really high depth. I know that James Gilliland um, has got quite a few really good high quality um, orb photos on his uh, Ysetti.org website. Mm -hmm. But um, some of those, well, actually, almost all of them, you can see it's they look like rings within each other. It's very interesting, and. I, I've been going over to the Secret of Light um, website and that's dedicated to the teachings of Walter and Lyle Russell, and they've got an image that looks just like an orb on their homepage. And I'm wondering if maybe these orbs have something to do with light or photon energy. You know, maybe that's what we are. Maybe we turn into orbs. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I was at Boynton Canyon in Sedona, and one time. I don't know. We, 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 we went to the main canyon, and it was great, and the energy was fine. But we're, as we were driving away, I decided to pull off the road down the way, and uh, I noticed, I don't know, I just felt something inside of me said, go up here. So I, I go off the beaten trail, and, and I end up in this mesa, and when I got there, the energy was just completely off the boards. All of the hair on my body was just raised. And in Sedona, they have juniper trees, and when there's a lot of energy in the area, the juniper, the, the, the branches on the juniper trees twist around like you, you, as if you have like a wet washcloth and you're wringing it out. They're all twisted like that. So I decided while I was up there, I was going to take a picture of this juniper tree. So I did. And uh, anyway, you know, I had a great experience there. By the time I get back to the uh, hotel, I upload the pictures, and I'm looking at that that the picture of the juniper tree and there's this huge orb there and I zoomed in on it and there was a face inside of the orb and you could almost see a hand holding the orb and I did a lot of research on Boynton Canyon and apparently there's a spirit there that goes by the name of Kamwitakapia I believe and oh, wow. I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the correct pr pronunciation and even had a picture of her and it looked like her cool yeah so <laughs> 
you just never know what you're going to expect when you're you're dealing with orbs and I don't know if you notice this too, but if you look at like uh, when kids post their pictures on Facebook, there always seems to be a lot of orbs around kids, like at yeah. school dances and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have noticed that, and it's funny too because I even looking back in some of my pictures, I noticed that they showed up a lot more in photos of me when I was younger than they do now. So yeah, that's uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. It'd be kind of cool if we could just like capture one, but I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're gonna build jar out and just go. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah, man. Use it. Use it as a. <laughs> use it as a ping pong ball or something. <laughs> I don't think they would appreciate that. Uh, probably not. No. H have you have Have you ever used a Ouija board? Uh yeah yeah actually I did um when I was younger you know everything is when I was younger when I was younger I guess I just don't you know live <laughs> on the wild side anymore or something but. When I was yeah. a kid. <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I, I did. And, you know, uh, we, 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 we started playing around with it. And then all of a sudden it changed from Ouija board to alien contact, uh, you know, device. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we started trying to use it to, uh, to communicate with uh, extraterrestrials, which, by the way, worked pretty darn good um, because I remember we were able to um, arrange sightings, I, I guess is what, you know, the, the best I can put it. It felt like we did anyway. Maybe, I don't know. Oh, wow. It had nothing to do with it. But it, we actually got to, like, a, come up with day, days and times and everything um, to go outside and look at a certain, in a certain direction at a certain time at a certain, you know, on a certain day. And we, lo and behold, every single time, like clockwork, there would be a UFO, uh -huh. and um, it was really interesting. It was it was it was fun. Well, the thing about the Ouija board is that it's it's kind of like meditation. Uh, just like when you meditate, you always protect yourself spiritually before using a Ouija board. Yeah. Because you never know what you're going to come in contact with. I know um, an ex girlfriend of mine and my daughter and her daughter's use of Ouija board one time and it was just going crazy it was all over the place but but giving us like lots of information it was it was a, a great experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah at, we used to put a big chunk of quartz crystal on the on the board and I remember we used to use uh, sea salt um, and kind of just made like a this little barrier around the board and said okay you know uh, this is there's no, n nothing's going to come through that's, you know, negative or has any kind of, you know, uh, negative intent or whatever, you know. And it seemed to, and it seemed to actually work really well. And I think it was the intent behind it, too. If you go into it thinking that you're going to contact some kind of creepy, you know, discarnate energy or devil or something, then that's probably what you're going to get. But, um, <laughs> you know, it can be used as a good tool. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, a lot of people give them to their kids as Christmas presents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, here you go, my little 12-year-old child. Have a Ouija board. Have fun. Yeah, yeah. Have, have fun with that, you know, and then the next thing you know, they can't Dreaming. sleep at night in the room alone. And, oh, jeez. Not uh, good. No, no, not at all. And, you know, and they don't include instructions on there teaching you how to, how to protect yourself either. You know, it's just like, here's the board. Have fun. Tell Satan yeah. I said hello. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> is like uh, handing someone a metaphysical loaded gun and saying, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Greg, I also remember you saying something, too, about some experiences that you had um, with, uh, with uh, a doppelganger. I hope I didn't cut you off just then. No. Well, I, I just wanted to make sure I got a chance to ask you about that because, you know, I, I had an experience with um, a doppelganger when I was younger. And, you know, it wouldn't have been so bad, but this actually kind of caused me some grief because it, it, it was seen by others, you know, like me doing things that, you know, would get me in, into trouble, you know, like other people would see me doing something ridiculous and then the next thing I knew I'd be trying to defend myself against it and, you know, the adults are all claiming that they're seeing me running barefoot through fields in my nightgown or see me in town past curfew or sneaking in or out of the house. I mean, it's uh -huh. just weird stuff. You know, what, what do you, I mean, what are your experiences with that? Because I remember you said that you also had something similar happen with you. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Uh, one is Jeff, the other is Steve. And I just get all, all for my entire life, people will come up to me, Jeff. I'm like, no, 
or Steve. <laughs> no. <laughs> People will call on the phone. Hi, Jeff. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, wrong number. But you know, it almost makes you wonder if, you know, some people are just having a little extra spiritual protection by having these um, essentially body doubles out there. You know, that's the first thing that goes through my mind. I, I know I've got a ton of protection on both sides of, of the veil, but maybe I have some protection that goes a little bit further into, uh, you know, physical manifestations of people that look just like me, God forbid, <laughs> but are out there also protecting me as well. Wow. Well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have had an issue with it if I wasn't getting in trouble, you know, because this, uh, this uh, you know, whatever it was, was out there, you know, uh, doing things that um, I wasn't supposed to be doing, you know. I, I would have probably been a little bit more receiving of of, uh, of of its presence, let's just say, put it that way. But And it, it's funny, too, because the activity from, from this followed me between two different states, you know, it it, it, ha it started in Arkansas, but it also kept happening to me in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, whoa! So this thing's traveling, and and you know, it, it's it's wow. stalking you. Yeah, yeah it's a, <laughs> a stalking doppelganger. <laughs> oh, geez. Probably has a radio show called In Six D Radio or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to wonder, you know, somewhere they're all laughing. Oh, you should have seen what the you should have seen the look on her face today, guys. I really got her good, you know. Exactly. Oh, Hi, this is uh, welcome to N6D Radio, <laughs> Kendra's doppelganger, and uh, Jeff and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, crazy stuff. <laughs> now you were talking earlier about how you you would use the Ouija board for um, UFO contact. How old were you when you first saw, when you saw your first UFO? Uh, I was about nine or ten when awesome. I first, yeah, when I seen the, our first UFO. My mom might remember some things a little bit differently though, because um, I know we had a really close encounter with a UFO in Arkansas, right on the highway. We pulled over um, on the side of the road. It was me, my uh, my stepdad, and and my mom, and. Um, I know I was around that age, but uh, the experience, for some reason, appears to be blocked a little bit from my memory. Um, I, I don't know why, but uh, it's not as vivid to me as it used to be, and I can't remember things. I can't remember it as, as well as I used to. But the mo most memorable UFO sighting, uh, sightings were definitely from growing up in Arkansas. I mean, it was almost a nightly event for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we even, like I said, we got to a point where we could meditate, and then they would show up within the hour outside. And then also I witnessed, oh, gosh, I don't know how many during my visits up at the uh, James Gilliland Isetti Ranch. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to see a UFO, go to the ranch. You'll see a UFO. <laughs> or as far as I'm concerned, the Gulf Coast of Florida. I've seen so many here. I've been seeing them all my life. I remember the first notable one, um, some friends of, uh, of mine and I were having a keg party, it was at a place called On Top of the World, and we were, I don't, I don't know, 18. And forever, whoever's listening, yes, uh, drinking was legal back then at 18. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so um, anyway, we got there, and we had the keg, but we were, we were waiting for the person to bring the tap, and that person hadn't arrived yet. And there was probably six or seven of us there at the time. And we're on the top of one of the mountains, in, uh, on the Casco Mountains, and on this other mountain across from us, these three um, UFOs came up over the mountain, oh. hovered there for several seconds, and then took off as fast as light. And uh, we all saw that, and we were just, like, mesmerized. It was, it was a great experience and something that, you know, you, you have other eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. and, you know, it gives validation to the fact that, yeah, this happens, this is real, and, you know, they are out there. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you hear a lot of people that, say, well, I believe in them, them, but I've never seen them. But all you really need to do is to ask your guides, ask your angels to say, this is what I want to see. Show me. Mm -hmm. Show me. And then go outside. Pay attention. Open up yourself to the universe, and they will appear. Yeah. I've also noticed, too, if you have fear um, or you're not ready for, for certain things. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's funny because when I was in Washington, um, I started getting a little bit frustrated the first couple of times um, that I was out doing the UFO watches, and James kept telling me, you know, 
if you've got a lot of fear inside of you, they're not going to show themselves. No. And I'm thinking, you know what, this is, I've got to let it go and stop trying to control the situation and just say, okay, if this is what I want to experience, then I'm going to experience it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, um, got to let go of the fear because I think that's the ultimate, I don't know, bars on the, on the window for, for all of us is fear. Oh, definitely. And yeah. it's, it's like what, what I was mentioning before, too, about, about, about dreams, you know. And, you know, once, once you let go of the fear, your dreams become more prophetic. And, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not worried about the stuff that comes up in your dreams, which is usually whatever uh, stress you had throughout the day. Um, and it, it, it opens itself up to a whole new world. And usually your dreams will either be just, you know, happy dreams or something prophetic. But, you know, in a similar way, you know, you, you, you want to have that positive vibe. Even when you see them, here's a great example. Um, when I was in upstate New York, I don't know, about three years ago or so, I saw this beautiful, bright light. But I wasn't sure whether it was a star or not. So I just sent the intention, if you are a UFO, show, show, show yourself to me in a different way. And right after that, it expanded into this huge light mm. in front of me. And then went back down and then expanded again really big. And I was like, thank you. And it, a lot of people will tell you, because I'm a triple Libra, nothing surprises me. Nothing will make my jaw drop and say, oh, my God, <laughs> Include, including that experience. I was just like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. So how, how many UFOs do you think that you've seen in your lifetime? Oh, man. I, you know, I know, I know m more than 10, 15. I, I would say probably about between 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I've, I've noticed, though, that the sightings kind of um, dissipated after a little while, and I almost sensed like it was because, all right, you've seen enough to you know now. <laughs> share so now with other people. We're going to go and share with somebody else. That's, seriously, that's how I, what I, how I kind of, you know, took it. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So. <laughs> I've got this, uh, it's a 5x42 it's a digital night vision ranger, it's called. It's a, it's a monocular, uh, infrared uh, monocular, and if you go out there and look at the UFOs and just scan the sky up and down, and you can't go 10 minutes, 15 minutes without seeing a UFO. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another good investment. Now, I mean, are those, uh, and those are within the realms of reasonable affordability for most people? <laughs> yeah, that's why I bought <laughs> that one. It was, I think it was around three, $400. Yeah. But, I, I mean, a lot of these other, you know, these generation, whatever they are now, I mean, you're talking three, $4,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like one tenth of that. So it's it's you know, I guess in comparison, affordable. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, it's it's still a nice chunk of change. You know, three four hundred bucks. You can find them on eBay. Hey, but you know what? I'd rather do that than waste my money on something else. You know, like a new television. Why not just get one of those and go outside and watch the real show out now? You know. <laughs> I've, you know, you know, Kendra. I've said that so many times that I'd much rather go out and uh, and stargaze than watch TV. Absolutely. Yeah. I just wish the mosquitoes weren't big enough to carry me away. <laughs> yeah. So, and but, soak up the rosemary oil. <laughs> what, what's your uh, belief on fairies? I know that you do a lot of artwork and sculpturing. Fairy, the realm of fairy has been part of me ever since, oh my gosh, I was old enough to even know what a fairy was. I, I just, man, it, it's, it's a very real place to me. It's a really real um realm and that's I escape there and try to go there as often as I possibly can because that's where I just want to be but um, yeah I, you know my artwork I do a lot of my artwork um, based on uh, mythical you know creatures like the fairies unicorns mermaids you know more horses and everything and um, yeah I, I definitely I believe in fairies Greg <laughs> what is what is what is your motivation when you when you create a sculpture of a fairy? Are you just doing what you feel looks like a fairy, or do you take something off the internet and just try to model it after that? Or, you know, I, I think a lot of artists make that mistake because you start to see things that you 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 really um, appreciate and you like a lot, and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I like right there, and then you try to emulate or or mimic that. But um, and and I made the the same mistake, and. I have learned that that is not really truly being an artist, first of all. Um, and mm -hmm. so my my inspiration when I do a sculpture now or when I do any kind of art really is 
coming from within myself, and it's also coming from what I truly envision to be um, what this creature or this being is that I'm trying to create. It's like a portrait. It's like a portraiture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because I never even knew this before, but my mentor of all times, Brian Froud um, from World of Froud, um, he also he describes it the same way. He, he, these are portraitures of, of these creatures that he actually sees. Um, and it's not seeing with your eyes. It's seeing with the heart. It's feeling. It's, it, and it's, it's the dream state. It's what comes to you in dreams. And, um, you know, that's, that's where I am now beginning to realize that's where the true creative nature of, of what I love about fairy and what I love about sculpture is all about. And you, you do. You have to break away from looking at other people's stuff and going, oh, my God, that's wonderful, that's beautiful, and then trying to mimic or emulate that. you got to go within yourself. You've got to pull from, from your own, you know, inspiration, your own creative uh, energy. And those beings or those creatures, these fairies, the, these energies, they come to you when you open the door to them. They can't come to you if you've already got, you know, the – somebody else's vision in your head. You have to clear it out, and you have to let them come to you and um, pull from that. I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, no, no. that's definitely what I've learned. I can, I can definitely relate to that, especially as an artist and a musician. You know, and what, you, what you're saying, at least from the analogy of a musician's standpoint, this is the, the difference between remaking a cover song mm -hmm. and writing your own material. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect example. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, I was, I was doing a little uh, research on that, and I found a, re a really good description. It said a fairy is a type of mythical being or legendary creature in European folk folklore, a form of spirit often described as a metaphysical and supernatural being. Fairies resemble various beings of other mythologies, through, though even folklore that uses the term fairy offers many definitions. Sometimes the term describes any magical creature, including goblins or gnomes, and other times the term describes a specific type of more ethereal creature or sprite. Fairies are generally described as human in appearance and have magical powers. Yep. <laughs> I thought it was funny, though, that one time. Remember, uh, it might have been three or four shows ago when, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Right before we go on air, we might say something funny, and we'll just start laughing before we go on air. But this yeah. one time, we just kind of got caught that we were both laughing. And I told Kendra it sounded like we were either a couple fairies or gnomes or something like that, just because of the giggling that was going on in the background. Yep, absolutely. I love that. I remember that show. I thought that was <laughs> really, really awesome. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that also pulls, pulls you back. And the reason why I love – you know the realm of the of fairy so much is because it is it 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 comes from the the earth and from the from nature um it's it's just um i don't know it's so magical and and mysterious and it has so many different um aspects to it that you know it could be it, some of these creatures can be good, some of them could be evil, some of them could be tricksters, misfits, but they're all still fairy. You know, it's it's all still lightheartedness. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, you can't really go dark with it, and you can't really, you know, I mean, it's it's just a a really beautiful realm, and I wish I knew the spell to step into that realm and just stay there for a while uh. because. It's just such a magical, magical thing. And sometimes when I'm outside and I'm in my element and I'm, I'm out there with my plants and I'm looking at these butterflies and, you know, caterpillars and all of this life and all this energy, you know, that's when you can see the fairies. That's when you can see that energy. That's when you can see the playfulness of nature and it all starts becoming this big picture, you know, and, it, and it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's just a, a, a beautiful Thing to pull inspiration and creativity from. I love it. It's funny that you mentioned butterflies and caterpillars, which are which is a very uh, metaphysical creature mm -hmm. within itself. The whole rebirth thing, too. Absolutely. Now, Sean in the in the chat room is saying you must not step on them. <laughs> <laughs> no, you mustn't. <laughs> no, and I'm thinking no. if they hang out on dog shit, then they're guaranteed for me not. <laughs> I will I will not step on them, but. <laughs> 
Oh, geez, now, yeah. my, my previous landlord is a yoga instructor, and I was renting a studio apartment from her, and she has this beautiful garden and lots of fruit trees on her property. And I remember her telling me that a previous tenant told her that she had never seen so many fairies than what she saw around my landlord's garden. Yeah. Yeah, and like Sean's saying now, um, and, and I know exactly what she's saying, you're not supposed to disturb a fairy ring, which is represented by the uh, mushrooms. If, if, I'm, if I am on the same page, <laughs> yeah. it would be a ring of the mushrooms, and then you know that that's um, a sacred spot for the fairy. And, uh, yeah, so absolutely. So, so did she have a lot of uh, mushroom rings, fairy rings? Uh, no, she just had a bunch of different... Um, beautiful flowers there and a lot of, lot of aloe. Um, that was my magical aloe. I'm not going to go into that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Cure all. Oh, yeah. Well, it has something to do with uh, urine therapy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll spill the beans. If I, if I went outside, I would and, and have it, you know, I'd go outside and have a cigarette because I don't, I, I wouldn't smoke in whatever place I'm at and I had to pee, I would pee on the aloe. And, oh. and this one particular aloe plant that I peed on was much bigger than the other ones. <laughs> so oh. I, I was guessing it had to have been the magical aloe. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, hey. Yeah. You know, that's good stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot? My thoughts on Bigfoot, oh my goodness, you know, I have been pondering that for a long time, you know, I, I've, I've seen something very, very strange in Arkansas that I could have sworn may have possibly have been um, a, a, a Bigfoot, and as you get older, you start to rationalize what you, what you think you may have seen, and I don't know what it was, but either these creatures are, they're either a figment of our imaginations or they're real and they're fifth dimensional and they can just go in and out like the orbs do and ghosts and everything else. Uh, military experience, experiment gone wrong or broke out and disappeared in the forest and they haven't been able to track it down. I don't know, really. And, you know, Joe Rogan's out there looking for him now, so we'll, we'll know soon enough, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he's on the case. <laughs> So uh, what do you think? I mean, what, what do you think about this uh, hairy beast we're all after? <laughs> I'll tell you, out of all the paranormal phenomenons, this is the one I have the hardest time buying. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that the Bigfoot exists or doesn't exist, but by now, if there was such a Bigfoot creature, then surely there would be much better evidence than what we have. I would think so, too. And the only thing that would even come closely, um, you know, as a, I don't know, it has to be some type of fifth dimensional type of thing. I mean, you would think that they would have found poop. I mean, these things are huge. They're full-grown man-type creatures with these huge footprints. I mean, they're finding footprints, but they're not finding poop. Mm -hmm. Or they're not finding, you know, hair or, or something that can be linked to it. So, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> I have a hard time with it, although I know, I, and I've even had people tell me experiences that they've had, and they, they've firmly believe that they were face-to-face -face with one of these things, but I don't know. Now, I was doing a little research on it, and in 1847, Paul Kane reported stories by the Native people about skookums, S-K-O-O-C-O-O-M-S, skookums, oh. okay. a race of cannibalistic wild men living in the peak of Mount St. Helens. And... Uh, they, they go on to say that the skakums appear to be, have been regarded as supernatural rather than natural. And you hear a lot about extraterrestrials and UFOs around Mount St. Helens, so I guess you never know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very really interesting. Then uh, Daniel Boone was reported to have shot and killed a 10-foot hairy giant he called Yahoo, or Yahoo, just like the, the search engine, Yahoo. Huh. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, there there is documentation out there, but, you know, there is, yeah, okay, so show me the proof. But then again, yeah. I mean, how do you how do you prove a, a ghost? How do you prove a fairy? I mean, you just got to use your own inner discernment. Well, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, what, we, we've got something. I think it's, it's from Florida. It's the, the skunk ape. <laughs> I haven't heard of that one, no. Yeah, it's, it's a skunk ape, and I, and I might have the story a little bit, 
mess up here, but I'm going off memory. But supposedly, I think he's in Florida, around the Everglades somewhere, and they call him the skunk ape because he stinks so bad. It smells like a skunk. And they always know that he's been around because it's a hideous, odor that mm -hmm. they that they're claiming that uh you know that they smell and then they either see him or um they uh you know i don't know hear something i don't know but uh yeah the skunk ape here in florida <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. maybe he'll be out there surfing with bigfoot <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully they'll get washed up too because doesn't a foul odor uh, linger around bigfoot too as far as yes. you say yeah yep. so you know, there's a lot of stories out there about a race of extraterrestrials who created various slave races of humans to mine gold for them. So is it possible that Bigfoot was one of these experimentations? Hey, that, that's, a, that's a possibility, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's still, the, you know, with all of the technology that we have, you would think that they'd be able to just comb through the entire, you know, national force of every major state or wherever the sightings are and get something on on record, some type of, I don't know, thermal reading or something, or mm -hmm. <laughs> something that could, uh, you know, prove it. But, you know, maybe they don't want us to, to, to know he's out there. Maybe that's the part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Go <laughs> away. <cover> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're all in politics right now. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> maybe if you shave them, they look exactly like George Bush. <laughs> And that's what, you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, I think if you shave George Bush, you, you come up with a reptilian. <laughs> yeah, but it. that's another story. Anyway, that's going to wrap things up tonight for us, folks. I hope you all had a good time with us. And uh, I'd like to thank our callers for calling in and spending the last two and some odd hours with us. <laughs> Uh, next week, we're looking at getting Astrologer Panther Jim 90, 1995 back as our guest, so stay tuned to In5D.com and In5D Radio for further announcements. On behalf of my co-host, Kendra Gilbert, this is Greg Prescott from In5D.com. Namaste, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>